Well, first of all, I should say that thank you, Leah and Dipti, for you know putting together this uh, this event. It's really beneficial, and I imagine it's also you know of great benefits to to all the audience here. And thanks for including uh, you know Boston Bio, uh, you know, and uh, giving us the opportunity to present. Um, some of you might have uh, heard our name, but uh, we're, we're you know a super early stage startup, and uh, the company actually has only been a one year old. Um, and we've been building our uh, venture scale and pilot uh, facility um, uh, together with, with uh, I would say, great sponsorship from uh, University of uh, uh, Illinois uh, at uh, Urbana-Champaign and uh, also with a significant help from RBRL. Uh, so really appreciate those ends of the help. Um, and uh, we, we are a you know, uh, small size, I would say tiny size uh, of uh, uh, CDMO trying to um, you know, contribute and help, uh, um, I would say, bio-ingredient companies uh, to basically go to uh, go to scale, um, the you know a lot of you guys have been sitting through um, sort of the session. Maybe you know some of you probably the whole day already. Um, so I'm going to try to be maybe brief on on the background side. And I think we all probably have a I would say a very clear reason on on being us here today. Um, so maybe some of the general background I will be very brief. Uh, as you guys all know that biomanufacturing is really hard on, on multiple angles, I would say. And there are basically five steps uh, to, to go through this process. And, and what I'm trying to focus on is, is on the, the development side or on the technical side. And now we're gradually getting to uh, the scaling up side. And you know, I don't need to read through this. I think you know, all of us here knows this pretty well. Um, so when it comes to uh, what exactly is hard, right? Or, or how does that picture match with, uh, let's say the current market offerings or, or the trend of, of what the market has um, is now, if you look at the market landscape that uh, the, the front end is actually increasing or kind of a boosting at a very significant speed. And if you think about how many strands that some of these companies, uh, either the big guys or the small guys are actually developing and how many prototypes they can actually screen through, you're looking at hundreds of different strands on a sort of hourly base, um, you know, depends on the size of your platform. And then at the same time, if you look at existing assets on the large scale manufacturer side, um, I mean, you know, capacity is in a, a, a huge shortage, let's say, or the demand is high, but there are something uh, out there, right? There's, there's some companies that has assets and there's a, quite a few folks here that are offering the capacity on that end. And there's, a, I would say, uh, capacity or assets wise, there's something there that we could work with. And then we are getting towards the, let's say the next generation of, of innovation uh, to, to scale, to manufacture. Well, what do we believe that, um, uh, uh, that why a sort of a rate of bio-based product being launched into market is only sort of not increasing as fast as uh, uh, strand development cycle goes. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, we would say significant contributing reason into that rate drop is what we believe in the middle scale, uh, which is um, the, uh, the development scale and the scale up into, uh, to get you ready for entry market uh, uh, production. Um, and then there's, you know, I've been in a session for a while now. I think there's quite a few folks highlighting the asset side of the things, the shortage on, on sort of on, on the market demand. And you know the the sort of the pros and cons on uh, how quickly you can assemble a team and uh, and what expertise that you 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 have to offer or you can offer I guess so so I'm not going to read through this um, uh, you know all these uh, uh, words here what I wanted to highlight is that uh, uh, this middle part we believe is a significant contributing reason for why there are only a very limited number of new products that actually can get into market, even if you have a, let's say 50,000 liter scale fermenter ready for you, right? So what I wanted to focus today here is, is on the development stage. Um, and one thing that I really wanna highlight here is that um, uh, while we all agree that uh, uh, assets and hardware capacity is a sort of, of significant demand these days, 
But at the same time that we wanted to have a sort of a reminder here that process development is sort of another uh, angle to, to look at this. Well, that if you have some asset ready for you, you still won't be able to launch the product, right? That there's a lot of questions you have to ask. For example, um, you know, uh, what what's are the sort of the right KPIs that you want to launch into the market? And when uh, how, or how your uh, KPIs should progress in different stage of, of, of development and different stage of production. Um, and even questions on, uh, you know, how you would control certain parameters of the processes um, and how you would uh, sort of uh, make the progress so that what, what uh, the sort of are the right KPIs showing at the right stage for you to progress through the market. And those are the kind of the questions that, that you want to ask um, when it comes to development cycle, when it comes to how you can get ready for your specific process or product right in, into the market. And, and I listed a few here when it comes down to um, let's say the, the very sort of a down to earth technical questions here. Um, and, and, and before I kind of get into uh, these questions, and, and I wanted to point out that uh, how, how we are thinking about this is that uh, uh, if you are in a strand development cycle and the way that you are doing the strand development is, is in a way very purposeful, right? And a lot of them are, I would say, fairly maturely uh, uh, commercialized. And the reason I say this is that uh, if you think about how you want to, let's say, develop a, for example, inclusion body for E. coli or some sort of a security protein based on PICIA, you, you do that with a sort of a very intentional purpose. Well, you have a more or less commercial base strain or host organism. And nowadays, I mean, you know, most of us know which company or which platform has a, let's say, relatively higher reputation or what platforms are good at what things, let's say we, I think it's fair to say, we generally have those ideas. Um, so, so, so those processes are, I would say significantly more efficient than five years or 10 years ago. But now if you're coming back to process development uh, uh, cycles, right? So that what well, we, most of the time we don't even have a cycle, right? I mean, you know, if you think about the strand development side, you have DBTL type, type of things, well, you know, everybody's familiar with, but for process development, uh, what we feel that folks on the market, what we are trying to do or what we've been doing is more or less uh, uh, repeatably kind of doing reinventing the, the wheel kind of effort. Um, and a couple of examples would be, you know, uh, when you take a strand to a mature uh, CDMO, let's say, and then you would have to go through every single parameter, uh, probably more or less from the beginning, right? Or, or let's say compared to if you do it in-house, um, you would have to test, let's say, all sorts of different temperature ranges, pH ranges, how you're gonna do the induction, and when do you do max feeding, and when do you do, let's say, minimal feeding, um, and then how do you control acetates, let's say, for E. coli uh, type of questions. So what we're trying to focus on is, is, is these questions, and we're trying to build a platform where we can really help, um, uh, uh, I would say, hopefully, majority of the folks to be able to get through uh, these development cycles in, in a very efficient way uh, to, to be able to you know, uh, optimize the process. Um, and one um, kind of uh, uh, a general example that I would like to share here is that uh, um, uh, a sort of a systematic approach to significantly shorten the process uh, uh, optimization cycle and the and how to correlate them to scale, right? Um, I think that's that's kind of a common question you guys probably got a lot. Well, well, that um, you know uh, you can easily have a set of KPIs for bench scale. But then when you are moving along into the process, um, you know, to pilot scale, let's say to a hundred liter scale, to then to a thousand liter scale, then you start to gradually lose track of, uh, uh, of what kind of a solid KPIs that you would have. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we have quite a few uh, clients and potential clients that are, that are in this uh, uh, sort of a stage. And they oftentimes they got challenged by their investors that, uh, you know, the, basically you got the picture well uh, in micro scale or venture scale KPIs and scalability in a way is quite clear. But how do I assure you that these are the KPIs that you would get into uh, entry market production uh, uh, scale, right? Like what do they look like on 10,000 liter? Um, so, so the way we are thinking about this is that 
how do we consolidate these conditions into one single platform? Um, and, and, and how do we sort of shorten the cycle, right? Um, so so I, I would say, before I get into the details here that I wanted to maybe put a reminder here that we're not trying to build a, let's say mathematical or statistical platform that will solve all the questions. I don't think we have the capability or even theoretical, uh, theoretically, I don't know if we're able to get there, but, but what we are trying to uh, develop and build a platform is that we want this platform to be mature enough well, you have the right focus and the right direction to see to a significant saving of time, right? This is not going to solve all the problems. So, so if you think about uh, uh, what what are those parameters and things that are in common for for biomass fermentation, secreted molecular, and intracellular products, is that you can think of them in a way of of, of multiple sets of equations um, and, and things that you could optimize through some mathematical approach. Um, so, for example, I listed the four sort of uh, 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 steps or parameters here, I guess. Um, uh, there's the, 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 the key variables that describes it, the processes, uh, which then gets you to the state equations, which basically is describing how your, let's say, your growth functions goes and then how your induction goes, let's say, glycerol, methanol, and some other things. Um, and then there's boundary conditions, which is pretty clear that they have to make a biological sense, right? You know, temperature, pH. Um, and then there's objective functions, uh, which then describes your goals. And, and, and I do wanted to highlight a couple of things on, on this uh, uh, here that um, on the objective functions. Uh, one thing really, uh, I think that can maybe can kind of occur uh, 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 to you is that uh, how we intend to use the optimal control and how we want to build it is really kind of can be simulated to uh, the real life examples. And optimal control here, uh, a great example here in real life is that imagine that if you're driving and you are trying to you know, get to a stop sign uh, with a full stop, right? So, so in that kind of a, a stage is that what your objective functions uh, look like is that you have two choices. If you're not in a time rush, you would want to get to a, a stop sign with a full stop uh, with the least fuel consumption, right? That's your objective function. And then you have a uh, state functions that describes your, your status quo, let's say, how you're driving, and then you have your boundary conditions, which is how much time you have, how much gas you have. So that's one set of conditions. The other set of conditions is that you are in a, a super rush, let's say, and you want to get to a, a full stop sign without the consideration of how much gas you're going to burn, right? So that's also a, a different uh, objective function. And I think you intuitively, you do a, you are able to think of uh, how you want to get there, right? You push the gas pedal the hardest so that you can, and you stop. Um, and then uh, the vice versa for the uh, for the um, you know you if you want to just cruise along. So these are the examples that we could really apply in here. And I know I'm simplifying this quite a bit, but what I want to get to is is think of this uh, sort of a driving and stop sign situation as in a way of how you want to optimize your processes so that you have multiple solutions when you do go to scale, right? So uh, two typical examples here for most of the uh, startup and new ingredients that you often ask yourself, one is when should I consider cash is king, right? So which basically means I have to literally squeeze every single glucose into my product, right? I don't really care how much, how long it takes to, to produce the product, but I need every single glucose to be converted to the product as much as possible. Um, and of course, you have to bear in the cost of how much you pay the CDMO and the CMO. And the other set is when do I need to maximize my productivity, which is gram per liter per hour when my inventory is short, right? So imagine that your sales guy is signing up uh, with multiple major contracts and you need to deliver multiple metric ton uh, products to, you know, let's say multiple big guys and you need to guarantee a decent uh, uh, sort of, let's say, lead time with a very nice shelf life. So that's that's kind of uh, the framework that we're trying to work on and then trying to provide you with a, uh, uh, with a solution, let's say, uh, in process development uh, uh, scale. Um, so I probably should move on here. I spent a lot of time on talking through our, our platform. I, I won't be able to share much data here, but it's kind of, kind of a talking in general in concept uh, 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 because you know we are CDMO and we won't be able to share a specific case here, but I wanted to make sure that I kind of explain the case in a clear way. Um, 
So I guess this whole five minutes here on that slide is that what I'm trying to say is that we deliver scalable solutions beyond just the assets. Um, and we think this is uh, of relatively significant shortage on the market. Well, how you optimize your solutions and how you optimize your KPIs so that you know what you're working into when you're ready for entry market production, uh, particularly at 10,000 liter and 50,000 liter scale. Um, all right, so maybe kind of quick, very quickly going through a couple of the capability slides. Uh, we, I heard uh, quite a few examples in the morning where folks are trying to highlight on the downstream side. So I'm not gonna go through a lot of the details here. Uh, this is really trying to say that, uh, uh, kind of a put a reminder there that most of these ingredients we develop now or within the past five years, let's say, uh, tons of them require very sophisticated downstream processing either it's purity or a right level of the concentration and how do you convince FDA uh, to, you know, let, let's say for example, why 60% of uh, purity is the right purity and what else other stuff is in there, if it's a grass organism or if it's not a grass organism, right? So um, we, we help folks to answer these questions and we help folks to go through uh, FDA packages, uh, grass dossiers. Uh, and of course we offer, uh, you know, the technical solution side of things. We have to develop that solution and then help you walk through FDA. Um, and this is a kind of a busy slide here to sort of demonstrate what we have. And like I mentioned, we have a really great and close uh, engaging relationship with RBRL. And, and I think Brian is actually right after me on this, um, that, you know, which gives us a significant advantage. Uh, well, maybe in a way, both of us, I would say, uh, to be able to, uh, you know, rely on these assets and build the knowledge, build the platform uh, and provide the process development part to, to folks. Um, we have a whole bunch of fermenters uh, on different sizes. Uh, uh, different capabilities for, for the downstream side. We also specialize on cell lysis, uh, intracellular products, uh, including bodies, uh, PIKIA intra, uh, intracellular products as well, uh, purifications to get to the right purity, uh, drying and analytical support. Uh, we have a lab, uh, Mario, that we work on a sort of a weekly base for uh, FDA side of the things. Uh, we also have Roche CDEX and HPLC for some of the online, offline uh, monitorings, basically. Uh, and we can get into the details if you guys have any questions. Um, and just maybe some quickly uh, sort of showing the pictures. Uh, we have uh, eight of the uh, 1.5 liter fermenters and we're buying another eight to expand that uh, uh, capacity. Uh, 15 liter fermenter and 500 liter fermenter that's coming. Um, and then typical sort of downstream processing equipment, TFF, homogenizer, spray dryer uh, on different scales. Um, and then analytical support, uh, CDX for most of the sort of a metabolized measurements, HPLC and the SDS page. I guess I highlighted this here because we do work on quite a few different proteins and enzyme products here uh, before they are ready to be sort of analyzed by HPLC. We do a lot of gels. Um, our uh, business model is, I would say, maybe flexible. Uh, flexibility is kind of the key here, as we totally understand how sort of R&D cycle goes, I would say, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, we, we don't necessarily need to tailor a lot of things for the clients. When the clients are ready to come to us, that they already know what e which exact path they would need, uh, or sometimes even which exact scale they, they would want to have, um, uh, depends on their internal needs, their R&D needs, or their investor needs. Um, so flexibility, I would say, is the key here. The majority of our clients nowadays are basically on a paper batch mode, which is you know a typical sort of a CMO type of arrangement. Um, so sometimes we joke that, uh, uh, we run a CDMO platform in a CRO uh, kind of way to, to highlight uh, how much uh, development effort we, we, we put in the process. Um, um, so a couple of case studies, and these are the kind of couple of things I guess I can, you know, publicly talking about. Um, uh, one advantage of being kind of early stage companies that we do have some relatively impressive uh, numbers uh, just because of the cases that, you know, some of the cases we got lucky, some of the cases we can improve the KPI quite a bit. Um, so for example, in this case here that uh, we walked through this client uh, uh, based in Chicago, 
that uh, we actually had a 10x increase uh, on our biomass production uh, uh, within a few months of uh, process development. And by the time that they sort of graduated from us, I guess, that uh, the biomass title was actually significantly improved. Um, you know, by no means that we would be able to uh, sort of promise 10x increase for all the clients, but this is a good example that, uh, that uh, to highlight, you know, our development efforts um, for different fermentations. Um, probably not going to read through all these numbers here, just uh, something, you know, to, again, to highlight the uh, process optimization side of the effort. Um, and this is a PR that we did with the, uh, with the company. And if you guys are interested, we can send you some of the links um, that, uh, you know, for the biomass uh, uh, fermentation. And this is a joint effort with, uh, with UIUC uh, uh, BRL. Um, cool. So this is, uh, uh, you know, the last slide that uh, some of the contact information. Uh, Chupti is our business development manager. And uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of the of Boston Bio. Uh, feel free to you know kind of scan the QR code or send us an email or connect on LinkedIn uh, if you like, um, or feel free to ask any questions here. And uh, thanks again for for your time. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> so we have uh, good good time for questions, at least two to three questions. Uh, but I can get started for sure. So you mentioned being like a, acting like a CRO or a CMO. So I'm going to ask you a question no one ever asked me. So this is going to be a gift for you, really. You <laughs> yeah, sure. explained all the things you will do for a collaborator. Who would you, how would you describe an ideal collaborator for you? What would you want people to bring to you? What homework should they do before they come to you? Yeah, excellent. I mean, this is really a great question. Um, so most of the folks we come across is that they have a decent idea or, or even a mature strand uh, ready to ready to go to scale, um, but in a way, let's say, have relatively less idea uh, on how to uh, go there, right? So they, they have a clear goal on what scale they need to get into at what type have kind of a timeline, let's say, and to hit what type of uh, KPI to get into entry market production. Um, and then we would be, you know, the one to kind of uh, help them to break down the sort of the grand picture and put some multiple timeline bars on there and say, you know, this is the, let's say 12 to 18 months or even longer for FDA package data and all the other meetings that you need to have with them. Um, and then uh, there's an, another couple sort of a timelines there, uh, let's say fermentation development, scaling up timeline, and DSP development and scaling up. And then most of the, the, the cases we have to, let's say, generate samples for food application researches for enzyme uh, applications. So there is uh, gonna be a timeline bar on what kind of uh, uh, scale that you have to be able to consistently produce your, um, uh, you know, your samples, let's say R&D samples, let's say uh, sensory samples, uh, and maybe some other different samples. Um, and there are intermediates kind of uh, situations as well. Um, so those would be kind of the, let's say maybe the whole package uh, uh, of, of uh, things that ideally we want, we would want to do. Um, but, you know, of course we welcome, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you are in very different uh, stages. So, so for example, if you already done some uh, process development in house, we certainly welcome that. Um, in a way, the more data you could provide to us, the easier we could take you to scale. Um, but if you don't have anything, let's say, you, so you barely have a strand, maybe like a sort of a backbone structure, or you just put some classmates in there and you want to see if this is even like, you know, barely approachable or barely hitting anything, we would be happy to sort of uh, be the platform to do some screening evaluation kind of a platform for you. Um, yeah, so we welcome all, all those type of, uh, of clients, I would say. Thank you, Michael. Uh, please put your questions in Q&A. <clears throat> um, so, Michael, uh, I was thinking a little bit about uh, what you mentioned about, you know, being able to uh, come up with solutions based on previous knowledge and such. How open are you to non-canonical hosts and and can you talk a little bit about the host? There were some questions in previous sessions and previous speakers uh, were asked about the ki different kinds of hosts that they're uh, working with and uh, what would you like to see coming in to your facility? Yeah, yeah, that, that's really a great question. Um, 
in a, in a way, maybe this is actually a funny, funny one. So, so we do get a lot of uh, my, my uh, so, so my personal background and also our head of bioprocess uh, background is that uh, we, we have a lot of experience in, uh, uh, in, in the food space and then in, you know, uh, Johannes has a lot of in biopharma space. So, so we do get a lot of uh, requests or questions in, in a sort of a relatively traditional food space. Well, we come across, let's say, microbial community type of fermentation and even, you know, let's say uh, uh, like a statical liquid state kind of fermentation. And then, you know, goes without saying there's a solid state fermentation, right? So, so those, those ones, we, we do get a lot. And uh, we, I would say we try to do our best to uh, maybe accommodate the, uh, the needs out there. We, we want to see ourselves who are able to um, provide some help and hopefully some solution. But but we you know like like you like you said we do have a focus area uh, where it's 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 a precision fermentation um, it's a, a it's you know a bacteria typically E. coli and bacillus um, and then uh, for yeast we have you know Pickia saccharomyces uh, uh, type of uh, strands and then we have fungal which is uh, the most typical ones are Trichoderma and uh, Fusarium basically um, we we haven't. Uh, yeah, we haven't really worked on any aspergillus, but uh, you know, in, in previous life, that's also kind of a common strand. Um, so those are the kind of, uh, you know, I guess if you want to call like this as a core uh, core capability area, I would say this is the this is our core capability. Um, and then on the downstream side, we we basically manage through uh, uh, secreting molecules um, and uh, uh, you know cell lysis for. Uh, for intracellular products, we do a lot of work actually on the the ones that we have to break cells open and uh, and purify them to to the right uh, purity that they need. Um, yeah, uh, maybe one thing, one more thing, maybe I think was highlighting is that uh, we do have quite a few projects that uh, that are not only producing, let's say, nutritional type of uh, chemicals. We we focus on how to maintain certain products to be functional, right? So a um, couple of cases, I think everybody probably knows is a typical one in alternative protein is let's say casing um, that you need um, you know, a, spe a specific sort of a folding structure to make sure that they actually can serve the purpose to make the cheese stretchy, right? I, we worked a lot on those things. Um, and heme bovamyoglobin, I guess that goes without saying for color, taste and everything. Um, and then in enzyme business, uh, we have a couple uh, projects that uh, that you know not only you have to get the max amount of the protein out, but you have to make sure that uh, the protein actually functions in the way that you want. We have some sort of a weird proteins where they, you know, some clients expect them to be functional in super cold temperature, and while you know when you run fermentation, you need the temperature to be warm, right, 25 to 35 ish kind of a range. Um, yeah, sorry, I probably took too long to answer this question. It's a, <laughs> the, the, the precision fermentation is the core capability, but uh, we do a lot of, uh, let's say, relatively weird and uh, uh, interesting stuff too. <clears throat> we have one last question. We'll go a little bit over time, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How do you address the need for testing as an integrated process? Uh, not sure if I uh, uh, understand the question right as as an integrated process that we, we we do multiple steps through through this process right so we 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 start from sort of onboarding your strand and all the way to uh, go to scale um, and then so if you what if what you meant is uh, is uh, you know to take some intermediate samples from between let's say the end of fermentation before downstream or after some filtration before downstream uh, before drying let's say so we do have those intermediates and we have ways to take sample uh, to to test the, the functionality if that's what you're going for um, and I hope that answers the question uh, we do have some steps breaking down that being able to testing those uh, uh, those intermediates thank you Michael. Yeah, and if it doesn't answer the question or if you have any other questions, please reach out to Michael. You have his contact information. Thanks again so much. Michael. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, DT. Over to you, Leah. All right. Thank you, Michael. Our next speaker is Brian Jacobson at the Integrated Bioprocessing Research Lab. Perfect. Thanks, Leah. And yeah, it looks really good. So uh, thank you for uh, putting this on. I'm sure this is a, a long day. I was looking at the schedule and truly realized this is 12 hours um, for, for you guys. So. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to be included here. Um, 
my name's my name's Brian Jacobson. I'm associate director of strategic operations. I've been with IBRL um, about 10 years, university about 12. Um, so have been with this facility here for some, quite some time. So first I'll just mention um, University of Illinois has two pilot plant facilities. Uh, to this audience, IBRL is probably better known. Uh, this facility was uh, is designed uh, primarily for scaling up bioprocessing technologies um, that might include food ingredients, uh, industrial molecules, cosmetics, uh, et cetera. Um, we really kind of envisioned here at the state of Illinois early on with the biofuel boom of, of a decade or, or so ago now. Um, but this um, is in combination with our food science uh, facility, which has existed for quite some time. And this facility sits a little bit closer to the consumer. So we're making things like pizza sauce or beverages or, or baked goods. Um, we can support sensory uh, client samples, client, clinical animal studies and things of that nature. Um, to the outside world, these facilities really just represent one program. Um, and our staff has a lot of collaboration and uh, myself and a, and a colleague, Beth Kennedy, uh, help manage both of these facilities. So to this audience, a lot of the ingredients that might be produced in IBRL could move over to the food science facility as well. So we'll talk about both of these just in a little bit of detail. Um, the facilities themselves um, represent a total of about $45 million of investment, including a very large investment from the state of Illinois um, with the goal of helping build economic development here in the state. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in the end. So first, uh, I mentioned we've been open since 2018. And it was a great timing with the reason that many of us are, are on this call is we just had this phenomenal expansion in, in, in biomanufacturing and the bioprocessing in, in general. So really well-timed and, and we've just exploded in uh, activity since that point. Um, since 2018, our grand opening was in October. We've had 89 companies in our facility, um, trained over 150 students and industry members through some uh, workforce development that I'll talk about here in a moment. And we are revenue positive, which uh, the university is a very important thing to, to keep our relevance. So that's been great as well. We've uh, exceeded our, our pilot testing and training capacities. I think one of the, the challenges we have is we just don't have more square footage than we have right now. So again, I've got a couple things I'll chat about in a minute, but um, been a very, very busy facility. Um, the clients that are in here, we, we try to make sure that we reserve the right amount of time for those that have started with us and until they get through their full development cycle. And now we're really just trying to take that model and expand that as much as we can. So our business model we started, um, you know, we, we looked at this and, and, and knew that there's a, a tech readiness level gap. Um, I think that's really well understood amongst this group. And uh, through some work of my colleagues, we have a, a great fee for service business model with, a, with a, what I think is a easy or at least among the easiest of uh, contracting mechanisms of these types of facilities at a university. So that's very uh, straightforward and, and, and easy for people to, to work with us and interact here. We also knew we needed a trained and experienced staff. Um, and here in Illinois, we have a lot of food and bioprocessing experience. So we have a few folks on our team that have run fermentations over 100,000 liters. Um, and we also have a lot of folks that we brought in from other industries and other expertises. So our staff right now sits at about 60 people. Uh, 20 of those are full-time, 10 are in a kind of like a part-time role uh, of different types. And then the other half, the other 30 of those are our students, which are a really important part of our program. And I'll talk about those uh, in a few slides. Um, those students obviously are ready to join industry. And that's a, a big part of why uh, some of these companies love working is that they get to bring some employees with them as they scale up too. We also have a wide selection of equipment. I've got several slides on that, some partnerships that are really, really important for us and the success of an ability program like this. So as we've built these um, collaborations or worked with these companies, we've developed a, a strong reputation. We know quality work and, and doing it fast is very important. Um, we work with startups through Fortune 500 companies, um, startups, you know, seed uh, round, you know, series A, series B um, is kind of our, our wheelhouse of companies that we've worked with. And we have done work though, all the way up through Fortune 500 companies if we have a certain expertise or type of equipment that maybe they don't have. Um, as we say, though, if you need a bucket of corn ground, you can bring that in. We'll do that, too. Um, but obviously, some of these more complex projects are our wheelhouse. Uh, projects range from a, a day long to, to many years. I think we are our longest client is getting close to about four years now. They've been with us. Uh, a really common rhythm, though, is that companies that are working on fermentation and downstream process optimizations will come in and run a fermentation, run week, one week, run their downstream process the next, and then we'll move through um, like a period of a week or two where they might analyze that data and then repeat that over and over and over again. Um, these companies can work with us and be on site here at our facility. 
or we can work independently and send data and that through. Um, some of the most successful clients have been companies that have worked with us at the startup phases, and then they'll, they'll allow us to, to manage those and have some students iterate through the matrix of, of different tests that might be needed down, uh, down range from that. Uh, we've had a lot of successful product launches and integrations. One of the things that our, we do, we take um, confidentiality very seriously. Everything that we do is under an NDA, of course, and then that's common everywhere. But we're, we don't push to add um, you know, different people to our website. Uh, we think that you know, word of mouth travels really, really well. Um, but I have a few up here just so that we, you know, that some of these clients have, have been here in our space. And for some of these, if you've been here a long time, one of the things that's nice is we have a cost reimbursable contract that we're able to do. So we don't have to define the work up front. Um, I feel like if a lot of the companies that we worked with had to define their work up front, um, they'd be very surprised uh, a year later as to what path it took. So flexibility uh, in the contract and flexibility in process are really important. Um, and more so, as we've uh, grown our business, we've really become a great collaborative space for clients uh, and vendors to come in and work with us. So I'll mention a few partnerships, particularly in the downstream processing area, that have really um, bolstered our ability to take on uh, different projects that have unique needs or, or things that maybe we didn't expect we would need when we built our facility. Besides companies, we also do a lot of grant-funded work, and, and this is stuff that we can talk about pretty openly. Um, so there's a couple of, of really neat projects we've worked on. So CABI is uh, the Center for Advanced Bioenergy and Bioproducts Innovation. Um, that is a five-year grant. It's one of the largest on our campus's history. It was recently renewed for another five years. And it takes uh, many different disciplines together from our crop sciences and environmental sciences groups to some of the um, MCB groups to take these organisms and do a full um, life cycle from field all the way through final product here in our facility. So we've organized uh, materials that have been grown across the country and brought to us. And then we go through all of the processing required to, um, in this case, work with a modified um, sugar cane um, that is an energy cane product is what it's called and has a couple of different unique modifications that allow us to extract oil and sugar, go through different pre, uh, feedstock analysis and or go through different feedstock processing and through final fermentation on these. Uh, on these. Um, it's a really unique thing that positions us well and the university well for our ability to work on some of these, you know, um, research projects that are multidisciplinary and actually bring us to a, a final product and, and kind of cross through some of those tech readiness levels you don't always see at the, um, at the research level. Uh, we also have a, a grant through DARPA um, that is allowing us to work on fermentation and downstream processing in some very unique uh, environments that don't necessarily always look like a pilot plant. And Biomade, uh, we're a preferred scale-up partner for that group and have had many, I think we have four active now and several others that are in the way, uh, grants with that group with uh, different consortium partners for um, that agency or that, that entity as well. So some of our core competencies, um, fermentation and downstream processing, obviously is uh, kind of the, the main focus of this talk. I, I've got a slide here in a minute. I'll go through those in more detail. But I thought some of these others would be good to know for this group because uh, it seems like there's a lot of creative ideas that are coming and knowing some other capacities could be really helpful. So improved separation of commodities being in central Illinois, as you might imagine, corn and soybean research is, is a huge part of us here. Uh, we have pilot scale lines for wet milling, dry milling, and dry grind ethanol. So we can take those and separate out starch, fiber, and protein. Um, gives us a lot of feedstock um, capabilities that maybe wouldn't exist at somebody that is only looking at fermentation. And we also have been able to use that equipment then sometimes to help with separations of downstream or of fermentation processes, but then also to work in some of the plant-based spaces for getting proteins and then look for secondary markets of maybe starch when pea protein was, uh, was really growing or is growing. Uh, to go into some of the, the products that are out there now feeding the fermentation or maybe a combination of fermentation and plant-based uh, type proteins. Um, we're looking at some of the, the uh, co-products that can go along with that. So in that case, starch that maybe would feed another type of fermentation. Uh, lignocellulosic material pretreatment. Um, there's some great capabilities I heard mentioned earlier. We have a continuous pretreatment reactor, 20 to 50 kilograms an hour of capacity there, go through enzymatic hydrolysis then we can run those types of fermentations off that material here as well. So great capacity there. Uh, I mentioned that CABI project with the uh, energy cane, very similar there, or sugar cane. Coverage development, sauces and purees, um, those both are kind of final product formulation pieces. So we've taken proteins that were made in our fermenters and being able to put them into beverages in our food science pilot plant. 
uh, sauces and purees, similar types of things can happen there. Uh, just to give you a breadth of idea, um, for sauces, we actually make all the pizza sauce in our facility for the University of Illinois campus. Um, tomatoes are grown on the farms and, and brought here to our facility where we can produce those. So um, have some actual production experience behind our staff there too. Uh, milling, we have a twin screw extruder for those that are interested in direct puffed or direct expanded type products. We can also do high moisture extrusion in the facility. And we do a lot of baking. So lots of ingredients go into to different baking application, bars and cookies and breads. Uh, we also make about a quarter million cookies here on campus each year um, as part of some of our training opportunities for our food science and ag engineering, crop science type students. So this is a, a really heavy slide and, and I'll walk through some of it. Um, we've done a lot of these types of presentations and, and try, to, uh, try to put everything on a slide to eliminate as many questions as possible. Um, but fermentation for us, our scale on our facility is really kind of 50 to 2000. Um, units don't matter so much in this space. It can be liters, it can be gallons, kilograms, pounds. It's kind of in that range, uh, depending on the unit operation of the processes that you're talking about. But in terms of fermentation, we really start um, most meaningfully at 19 and a half liters or a 16 liter working volume, and then work up through 1500 liters. Um, that is a great scale for us to take uh, clients that have uh, ideally maybe some three liter, one liter, five liter, um, third tank reactor in the lab experience. Um, though we have worked with a lot of companies coming straight from Flask as well with good success. Um, and then we can scale them up through this range to help them develop their DSP processes, to uh, get a lot more solid on their, their fermentation and their, their sterilization processes, and then also get samples that they can use for a myriad of different reasons, whether it be sensory or product formulation or you know, making a cloth or taking to an investor, or whatever those different types of testing uh, would be needed as you need kilograms or maybe tens of kilograms of material. We can handle aerobic or anaerobic um, BSL-1 organisms. So we are limited BSL-1, um, but we run both aerobic or anaerobic. We can run batch, we can run fed batch, and we have some capacity for continuous. Um, that always involves a lot more conversation than we would have just in a, in a webinar like this, but the equipment is capable. Have a experience with a wide variety of different feedstocks and organisms. Um, you know, dextrose and, and glucose is, is a start, but it goes much, much deeper and broader than that with capacities that we have. Uh, organisms, we've used all the model organisms, um, Saccharomyces and Empikia, E. coli, of course. Uh, we've also worked with algae, we've worked with Fusarium, um, and, and a few others that are out there too. So uh, open to those conversations at the scales here that we run at. Automation, remote control, and uh, data logging is, is all something that's part of our program. We have off gas at the facility. And I think we're always willing to explore um, different methods or, or models of, of, of control if needed for, for companies. We've gotten really good. We've got you know, full power logging capacity for a client when that was needed. Uh, we brought in some sensors we could plug direct into the tank and use those to get some additional data that was needed. Uh, always lots of flexibility in that space. And then analytical process support. So we have an analytical lab on site that we can uh, directly measure um, a lot of things that help decide in process level um, decision making. So YSI and HPLC, we can run, run gels, we have uh, microscopes and obviously BSC cabinets and, and incubators and everything that are there. Uh, we don't go to the level of, of GC or, or some other maybe uh, higher end analysis at those early stages. Uh, but we have some good partners that we can work with in, in that space for sure. Uh, another thing that we are, are really have, have built a program around is just you know getting in the materials needed for fermentation. Um, this became a, a pretty apparent early on with our clients with, that were coming from the lab and you know just thought that they would just buy you know a thousand one kilogram containers of, of dextrose from Thermo Fisher, um, and we were able to really introduce uh, some some better options for them. And then during COVID, things got really challenging. And now uh, we almost serve as a warehouse for most of our clients in terms of uh, these, uh, these ingredients that are common. So we stock most of the, the common ones that are required for the types of fermentations we run. We can handle ordering and, and bill through and all those things that are needed to, to really simplify that upfront tech transfer phase with our clients. Uh, downstream processing uh, is obviously uh, fermentation. There really isn't anything unless we have the capacity to separate. So we can do intracellular, excreted, or biomass process. Um, we've got good capacities all the way through. And probably most importantly, we have really flexible bays set up so that we can bring in your equipment and have that installed and ready to run in many cases the very next day. So we keep a pipe fitter, um, plumber, electrician, et cetera, all on staff that are able to work with us to get equipment up and going. 
And then we have all the utilities uh, easily available for quick connect and disconnect into our facility to bring those up. So that's really been a pride point and really uh, allowed us the flexibility we needed for a lot of the types of projects that we bring in. Uh, I'll go into these details a, a little bit in the next day, next slide, but harvest and lysis, filtration, precipitation, drying are all capable here. Um, and then we also have a class one div two uh, rated space for solvent handling. Um, so we can do things like hexane and heptane extractions. We can do ethanol precipitations. Um, we have a Hastaway tank um, in there as well um, that we can really handle, uh, honestly, about anything in this bio uh, bioprocessing type of environment, whether it's acids or bases or solvents, are, are really capable there. Um, and then just these great partnerships that we've formed with, uh, with these equipment vendors. So one of the problems that happen with, with downstream processing equipment is a lot of these vendors do have really good install bases and verticals in, in existing industries, but don't necessarily have all the pieces necessary to do a trial with small with, with you as a small company um, or even as a large company. So a lot of them have found value in placing their equipment here in our facility because one, we'll use it constantly because the demand in our facility is extremely high. So it stays in good shape. It stays taken well care of. And it keeps the uh, expertise high because we have our staff that's here part of it in this industry, always looking for, for what's new. Uh, and then also we have all the other pieces to showcase the equipment really well. So um, you know, having a centrifuge is great, but having a centrifuge and having a centrifuge in your demo facility um, can be useful. But when you're working with fermentation, you have to produce the broth and you probably need something like filtration or drying afterwards. And a lot of companies don't have that at their test centers. So they're starting to really realize the, the value that's here. And on the next slide, I'll mention a couple of these. So um, distax centrifugation um, and for broth separation is, is one of our primary pieces, but we also have a lot of expertise in membrane filtration. Um, and I'll talk just a bit here in a moment on the, on the filtration slide there about some partnerships we have. Uh, we also have a, a decanter for some really high biomass type um, projects as well. That was something we used heavily in our uh, corn wet milling type of space, but it's really proven valuable for, for some things in fermentation as well. For cell lysis, we have a bead mill and, and uh, high pressure homogenization. Um, the bead mill, um, we've got a, a really good partnership with WAB. They've, they've helped us bring that bead mill in and, and some lab scale capacities that are there as well. And then in filtration is really where we just have a, a huge number of partnerships. So for TFF, we have Alpha Lavelle's equipment um, in their spiral wound. So we have the ability to run that at the 1812 size, 2538 and 3838, which really just means either tens, hundreds, or thousands of liters of product that we can run that at. Um, and a whole variety of different um, capacities. So we can do RF, NF, UF, and MF, all possible on that skid. Um, a really great partnership with Novastep on, on ceramic membranes. Um, so we have a uh, kind of a smaller um, lab type unit for that and then a pilot unit. And we actually host a, a good portion of their ceramic membranes for the US and have uh, had a really uh, fantastic time working with them. Um, they bring their staff in and have, have brought some projects here to us. And then it, that equipment's also been available for our clients to utilize in their scale up to look at ceramic membranes for filtration or even early on for broth separation type processes. Uh, similarly, we have a plate and frame um, filtration unit. Uh, and that was from a partnership with SmartFlow. Um, they have a skid that's here, and, and similarly, they, they've come in and, and worked with us and, and really evaluated and, and worked with some clients who wanted to have the ability to go straight from fermentation into that membrane and then move on to some other uh, downstream unit operations as well, and be able to complete that here in the facility. On the dead end filtration side, bag filters, capsule filters, filter presses are available. We have a basket filter that's here too. It's XP rated if we need to do anything with solvents. And then drying is just a huge area of opportunity right now. It just feels like there can't be enough spray dryers in this world. Um, so we have a couple, I think we have up to three different freeze dryers in the facility. Um, for a spray dryer, we have a single unit right now um, that's capable of 15 to 25 kilograms of water removal per hour. And we are working with a couple of vendors to get what will probably be a semi-permanent uh, rental brought in for a smaller scale. Uh, we do have a lab scale glass freeze dryer, or sorry, spray dryer in the building. And then we're working on uh, bringing in a much larger unit, 50, 60 kilogram per hour uh, of spray drying as well to really partner up with some of our larger fermentation scales. Uh, tray dryer, we've, uh, we've brought in ring drying in the facility before. We have fluidized bed dryers um, and really can kind of go on and on in that space as well with, with the needs and, and our ability to try and grow that up. 
So next, I've, I've mentioned students a few different times in our workforce development. I uh, just want to focus here for a minute. So our student internship program has really been a, a highlight of our program. Um, we have a, a staff person that manages it, but it's really a team effort of people that work together uh, to, to manage and, and bring these students um, to be ready for industry when they graduate. So these students are, are heavily our food science, ag engineering, GB, uh, molecular uh, MCB students. Um, we've had a few different mechanical or electrical engineers in, chem engineers, et cetera. Um, have all been here part of the program. Uh, but this is tiered. They start off uh, typically as maybe a sophomore and, and they're doing things like taking out the garbage and cleaning the floors and learning about the environment. Um, but by the time they're seniors, they're working side by side with our, our, our full-time staff and most importantly, our clients on those projects that are typically involved in the, in the planning processes and the data analysis or maybe just the, the, the data um, uh, transfer over to the client and, and really have a good relationship that's there. And, and that's been great because then a lot of those students have had a, an opportunity to go work for those clients. And in many cases, the students know just as much about the process as the clients because they've been the ones running it here at the facility. So this typically hovers at around 30 right now. Uh, we're looking to grow that as we grow more staff. And I, I just threw a bunch of names up of different companies that have had uh, people here with us. We also have uh, um, short courses and some other opportunities. So our fermentation short course has really been popular. We now host that twice a year instead of just once a year. Um, I'll, I'll mention a few more things about that here on the next slide. Uh, we're also uh, extrusion short courses, corn wet milling have been going on for decades. Extrusion we're working on building right now. And we've done a lot of tailored opportunities where somebody can come in a company and just have a, an opportunity with our staff for a day or a couple of days to, to learn or enter a new industry or, or whatever that may be. Uh, my colleague Beth there pictured in the bottom also manages our professional science master's program. Um, so we have two of those, one in synthetic biology for food innovation, another bioprocessing and bioenergy. Um, those students are master's level students working on bioprocessing and our science and a business uh, curriculum together. Um, so those students are, are uh, also looking for jobs and, and have really good experience in our facility. This is our a couple pictures here of our, our latest short course there on the top, um, all the way through some of the fun things we do. Um, some of the graduated from our program owns a brewery here locally. So um, there he is talking about a different type of fermentation in the evening. So those courses are a lot of fun. We see some of our industry partners and our staff um, with the hands-on portions of those classes, which is a really kind of a hallmark of the short courses that we put together. Um, if anyone's looking to join that, I think we do have just a couple of slots left, or at least we did when I sent the slides in. Um, so if you're interested here, you can reach out to me or Amy who manages that for us. Um, the link is up here as well if you're interested in, in joining that short course. So just a, a couple slides here at the end about some things that we're thinking about for the future. Um, obviously everyone here kind of knows the information on this slide, um, that there's just a, a need for more fermentation capacity you know, at this pilot and demonstration scale. Uh, our facility, you know, works up to 1,500 liters, um, but there's a, a, you know, it's, it's challenging for, for some of those companies to find the right fit of, of what's next for them. Um, and some of these demonstration scale um, limitations are, are causing, um, they're hindering their expansion and what's next for them. So we've been working really hard at one. I mentioned our, our, our space issues here. We're looking to expand our facility. We've got a lot here on campus already picked out and really just, you know, increase throughput of our facility. Uh, we're also working very closely with some of our, our political partners in, in Illinois, um, industry partners in Illinois to build out a demo scale partnership. So I have a picture Governor Pritzker was in and we're really looking to see what we can do to help support, um, you know, that infrastructure development and others that are other pieces that are needed to help get additional capacity here into Illinois um, to, to meet up with some of the large scale capacity that does exist here and help go from IVRL to, to made up with that that could be available. Uh, we also are working very heavily in workforce development. So uh, we, we had some recent talks with Senator Durbin and some opportunities there to, to talk about what we're building in terms of workforce for, for Illinois and, and how we can partner with industry, partner with the government, partner with community colleges and others to, to build that out as well. Um, and then this last slide is just kind of showcasing what we look at for the future. Um, you know, this is uh, expansion that we're planning. We have a, a spot here picked out next to us that essentially done, will double our square footage. Uh, and add a lot more capacity in uh, some of the things that we're already doing and, and need more, uh, more of, uh, but also build out even more opportunities for educational uh, pieces, more drying capacity, and, and you know, boost our fermenter size up to about 2,000 liters, which is about what we'd be comfortable handling um, on a university campus. 
Um, with this, we expect to hopefully triple the number of, of companies we're able to work for or work with and, and bring them through to some of the larger partners that have been on this call and otherwise to, uh, to help bring them to some commercial success. Uh, so finally, just a few pictures here of our facility and some of the staff uh, doing what they do best. Um, I've got my contact information and really just appreciate the, the having the time to share with everybody. Thank you so much for that excellent talk, Brian. <clears throat> I really enjoyed the talk. And also the comment about uh, this event being 12 hours. We were initially planning out only eight hours, but we really got oversubscribed and had to push it to 12 hours. So now it's almost like a fermentation campaign. You come in at 6 a.m., think you'll leave at 2 p.m., but it will go on until 6 p.m. Something will go wrong. You have to think on your feet and fix it. So <laughs> Now you know uh, why I said we have all the automation equipment. <laughs> So thank you so much. And, and we have one question here. Uh, so I'll start with that. Do you or your clients use computational tools to understand cell metabolism, metabolism and cell fermentation? Have you seen an increase in usage of such tools to shorten R&D and scale up timelines? Sure. Um, so this is not my expertise, um, but I'll say that we're, we're definitely seeing a lot of clients that are, that are using, uh, using these types of tools and you know, particularly different partners that that have really, um, you know, kind of filled a niche that we're not doing at IVRL um, quite as much. So we're a partner that you know we don't want to take IP. Uh, we don't necessarily do the development work for you. Um, we are a resource of people who know how to run fermenters and that know how to uh, or that have the fermenters and the equipment to capable to move that through. But we don't want to own IP. Uh, we were here to are funded by the state of Illinois to help commercialize these technologies and, and get as many companies through that pipeline as we can. But as we're looking at this ecosystem, there's definitely space for that. So uh, Michael spoke earlier from Boston Bio about some opportunities that, that they're working on. Um, and, and obviously that's, that's a really important partnership for companies that maybe otherwise would not be ready for our facility. Um, Obviously, there's lots of other partners that have existed for some time um, that that do a lot of that great work at the at those you know smaller scales that we touch on. Um, we have the capacity to do three liter fermentations that are here, but there's others that do a really nice job of that and, and you know do the amber systems and those. Um, I think you know you deep you know know a lot about that, that type of work for sure. Um, but that's not something that we've done as much of, but we know is is happening uh, quite often. There's probably some others here that could speak to that topic even better than I could. Thank you. If there are any other questions, please put them in Q and A. We have time for a couple more. And but I will throw one question at you, Brian, that I did at Michael. Uh, who? How would you define your best collaborator? What what uh, type of criteria do you look for? And because you have experience, I'm going to ask you, what? How do you define your worst collaborator as well? So <laughs> what is the good and bad in your collaborators? Uh, sure. Can you share some knowledge? Sure. Um, I, I think it's, I think one word kind of defines both sides of that, and that is preparation or, or the lack of, um, you know, there's, there's, this space is very full right now, and we want our, our goal, and you know, that's, I mean, um, unlike a lot of other facilities, our goal is to help companies get through and, and be done with our facility to move on to the next one where they can do larger scale things and, and move on to production and commercialization. Um, we like companies to to be well prepared, know what they do know, and and, and also maybe more importantly, know what they don't know and, and need help with up front so that we can provide some of that information or get them the correct resources if, if we cannot. Um, that's really important that's there. Um, to define it technically, you know, if a company's got some really great, really great run data and a glass fermenter from one to 10 liters that's been iterated on and, and has, you know, not just been done once, but maybe been done five, 10, or, you know, more times and it has good data and maybe some semblance of knowing what their DSP process is going to look like, um, that really helps us uh, make them as successful as we can be. Um, well, the one thing that we don't like to do is we don't like to waste um, our time and, and their money um, trying to optimize a process at too large of a scale. Uh, we'll do it, but I don't think that's good for, for anybody involved or the industry in general because there's companies out there that um, are looking for space and, and, and need um, need that capacity to go forward. So if, if a company's got a, a good idea of what it is that they need and, and have that preparation going into you know, their first 100 liter or 300 liter fermenter, um, that could really help and, uh, and, and make sure they're able to, to use whoever their partner's time is most successfully. Excellent answer, Brian. I might use some of those words later for my <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, over to you, Leah. And if anyone has any more questions for Brian, you have his contact information. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Okay, it looks like our next speaker is Luke Williams at Idaho National Laboratory. Let me pull up your slides real quick. So, yeah, thanks to the ABPDU team and for everyone who's listening. And uh, I'm happy to have the time to talk to you about engaging with the Biomass Feedstock National User Facility for process scale up. And from here on out, I'm just going to refer to it as the BuffNuff. Uh, next slide. So the BuffNuff is a U.S. national asset located at the Idaho National Laboratory in Idaho Falls, Idaho, uh, with the goal to de-risk scale up for the bioeconomy, principally using um, cellulosic materials, uh, second gen, you know, uh, your corn stovers, your woody residues, your municipal solid wastes, you know, sort of non-traditional feedstocks. And we are the only facility in the world with quite this array of wide, uh, wide range of mechanical processing techniques, separation techniques. Uh, we've got capabilities that range from like gram scale processing all the way up to multiple tons per hour. So whether you're a smaller university just looking for some well-characterized feedstocks or a large multinational company looking to do you know, an 80 ton run or more, we can find a way to help you out. Uh, next slide, please. And with this facility, uh, it was very recently upgraded. We're really put, just putting the final touches on the upgrade that we've put in. We've greatly increased our processing capabilities. Uh, we added several new ton scale mills from knife mills to a porous concepts crumbler to shredders. So we can really deal with just about any type of waste that you want to put through this facility, or should I say waste that you would like to turn into a feedstock. Uh, we've increased our analytical capabilities, uh, everything from new particle size characterization equipment, um, all the way down to prepping um, tools to help prep stuff for SEM imaging. So we can really take your ton scale data and also gather the fundamental knowledge on, oh, this corn stover is biologically degraded. It's cell wall structure changed, nutrient transports have changed. That's what's affecting your yields and whatever pretreatment process you might have. So. Yeah, we do take fundamental science all the way up to like ton scale processing. And all of this is put together in a very modular test bed. You know, so if you want multiple different types of mills, multiple different types of separations, we can and do frequently arrange that for um, customers and partners. Next slide. Yeah, so the original facility was built in about 2010 and essentially just had a hammer mill and a, well, a dryer, a hammer mill and a pellet mill. So the idea, at least at that point in time in the bio industry, was pretty much minimize pre-processing costs, deal with the problems downstream, just homogenize, put it into a flowable, densified format and off you go. Um, did not work very well. Um, Turns out that there's a significantly greater amount of variability in a lot of these feedstocks than expected. And so we've looked to other industries such as the food industry to sort of develop tools to tackle these challenges here, particularly with this recent upgrade. Next slide, please. So this graph or these two graphs essentially illustrate this last point. The biorefineries really wanted specs that are coming in on the figure on the left hand side, where they have very specific amounts of sugars and lignans and ash content. And then the fi figure on the right hand side is what you can get out of the field. <laughs> so really about 30% of what came off the field tended to meet biorefinery specs. And of course, these refineries do want to operate in greater than you know 90%, you know, uptime and conversion levels and all that. So we have added a lot of tools to help take things that are messy and make them into very well-defined feedstocks. Next slide. <clears throat> and a lot of this was actually modeled off of the food industry. You know, originally flour milling, you just got a whole wheat out of it, but over the last 70 years or so, the that industry has added more process steps, but also 
gotten much higher quality feedstocks at the other end and overall increased the value of what can be derived from the market. So we are taking this same approach with materials like corn stover, forest residues, you know, any other type of ag residue, wheat straw, you, know, you name it, we'll, we can find a way to help fractionate it in such a way as to increase the value downstream. Next slide, please. So we do this in many ways. We've got a lot of expertise all the way up to like people that have worked with harvesting equipment in fields and looked at how crop quality changes based on location within the field, much less you know, between different states, um, different harvest equipments, different watering methods. You know, we've really kind of got a good base of knowledge on the variability that can be seen in the supply chain here. And as we bring it in, we know how each of those things deconstruct, how to pull them apart properly, how to use screening and other such tools to you know, uh, create narrower particle size distributions. We've got a lot on moisture management and storage. Um, some materials like corn stover are harvested once a year and then intended to be used as a feedstock supply for about a 12 to 18 month period and turns out it biologically degrades. So we've got you know ways of turning the like long storage times like that into essentially a value added part of your supply chain by adding small amounts of chemicals or enzymes to really like lower the concentration of what you're adding, but greatly increase the residence time. Um, and then after that, we've got blending, densification, and a lot of characterization tools, um, GCs, LCs and IR cameras, microscopes, that's just a whole suite of things to look at the products that we're making and making sure that they meet the quality specs of the process that is asking us to help out. Next slide. So as I've alluded to, these capabilities span a wide range of scales, all the way from ton per hour grinding equipment, uh, which has you know, sort of the I guess smallest set of options, and we've got a larger set of options at your kilogram scale, as well as a lot of material conditioning, you know, storage simula custom built storage simulators. So you can say, what if my material were held at this temperature, this moisture content, with this type of enzyme? You know, like we can do a lot of a lot of long term storage stuff, as well as full characterization on all of it. Be that changes in particle sizes, uh, chemical composition all the way from like proximate ultimate, just CHONS, chlorine, XRF for ash speciation, um, and as well as the capabilities needed to do a full compositional analysis with all your different sugars. Um, and not in our exact facility, but on our campus, we do also have access to a lot of SEMs, TEMs, AFMs, and can help prep material for that level of scientific rigor if it's needed. Next slide. So one good visual for this is corn stover. Uh, we used to essentially just take it all in, grind it all up and off you'd go. But if you put like wet leaves and husks into a hammer mill, you'd end up creating stringy messes that'll plug up all your downstream equipment. If the material's too dry, it just pounds those bits into fines that will then down, plug up downstream equipment. Uh, so we've started to incorporate tools like air classification, which like what they use in the like, potato industry, for instance, they'd essentially put a fan, run dirt covered potatoes over it, dirt blows out one end, potatoes end up out the other. But if you buy those systems and modify them a bit, to control the you know, velocity of the air and other such things, you can for about a dollar a ton, separate these things into the anatomical fractions you see there on the right hand side, you know, where you get your leaves and husks, your cobs, which still have some husks attached, and your stocks. So yeah, the analogy that's often used here is if this were a cow, you take out the valuable parts first before turning stuff into ground beef. If you grind it all up to start, there's no way you're separating the high value components out again. So we work on taking stuff, you know, working with the harvesters from the, all the way from the field, keep things in the right format that we can derive the most value out of it downstream. Next slide. 
So some of the new milling equipment that we brought in um, on the left hand side there, you can see our uh, ton per hour knife mill. We've got a forest concepts crumbler, which does a good job of making essentially three dimensionally consistent particles, it, as well as a standard sort of high torque, lower speed shredder for things like municipal solid waste, in addition to the hammer mill and, that we had earlier uh, before this most recent upgrade. Next slide, please. Other fractionation tools, uh, we've got a lot of different screens. Screens are a nice, cheap, easy, and effective way to remove dirt from material, which is quite valuable when you're working with agricultural residues. We've got an air classifiers at a couple different scales to start, start to separate some of these anatomical fractions. We've got ballistic screens from the MSW, uh, ballistic screens and eddy current separators from the MSW sorting industry. Because as we start to work into that fraction of waste, you need different tools than you might for just ag materials. Uh, we're also working with various companies to integrate uh, different types of sensor data and robotic and pneumatic sorting into uh, essentially making higher quality, cleaner fractions of these materials. And I'll touch on that a bit more later. Uh, next slide. So as we've gone through this upgrade, we've swapped out like our bale processing systems. So we go from having things that were much more erratic to like working with machine and equipment manufacturers to help design things to make bale deconstructors that don't essentially also grind up your material. So flow becomes much more used and you end up with much more downstream control. Next slide. And this air classifier that I've shown you pictures of for corn stover also works very well for forest residues. So you've got white wood, your bark, your needles, um, there was a talk earlier today where they were making, I believe it was two, three butane dial out of bark. I was very curious as to the quality of that bark and how things like the particle size or maybe needles content would affect the extractives in the system and their overall product yields. I mean, these are the types of research questions that our institution likes to try and help answer so that processes can be scaled up and operate reliably. Next slide. And actually, in addition to the sort of bulk anatomical fractionation that you've seen, we do have tools and when put together in the right order, you can get a um, tissue level fractionation. So if you do the right type of size reduction on your uh, corn cobs, for instance, some, through something like the crumbler that makes pretty uniform particles, you can run them over a gravity table, which is a lot like a combination of a screen and an air classifier. Um, to separate out the woody ring from this um, cob that's highly dense from the shaft, from the pit, or like the rind, there's just a, you can separate all your fractions so that if you were then to run in more of a campaign style, you can then tune downstream processes to have more or less acid based on the digest or base based on the digestibility of these components, for instance. Um, an interesting thing we discovered as part of our storage work with low loadings of an enzyme that I don't know and I'm not going to be able to answer for anybody. Um, they're able to actually pull the vascular bundles out of the pith in the corn stalks, which they're kind of the nutrient transport highways. Again, with the right amount of like low shear shredding process and a bit of screening, you could get your very spongy pith separated from these much harder rinds on your stovers and your vascular bundles <clears throat> to again try and improve downstream processing. Uh, next slide, please. And as I've noted, we are also working with municipal solid waste. Um, yeah, it's been interesting. So we have everything from hand sorting various fractions to get a better idea of what's in it. You know, your cardboard versus your glossy papers versus various other types of contamination. And then we'll look at those different multi-layered materials and are starting to um, develop ways to try and pull them apart because as packaging becomes more and more multi-layered, it'll be more and more difficult to recycle. Uh, so we are starting to work on the 
getting the pre-processing steps in place to make those separations possible to aid the recycling industry. Next slide. So at our kilogram scale systems, we end up with quite a few different types of sort of deconstruction. We've got like impact, which would be your traditional hammer mill compression, which might be something more like a beater mill. I've got attrition and ball mill type stuff or shears and disc mills. And of course, a lot of mills have multiple types of deconstruction, but we have a wide variety of tools to selectively pull your materials apart, as well as things like extrusion capabilities. So we've taken um, ocean plastics or mainly the like polyurethane, styrene kind of rich, as well as like netting and tarps. There's just a pretty wide variety of mess. And it is possible to do things like mix them with the fines from your biomass processing unit to make a partially bioremovable composite. Or you could use other you know, polylactic acid and stuff with your fines. But yeah, we do constantly look for, as part of this fractionation strategy, various co-product outlets. And, you know, markets to try and increase the overall value of the bioprocess. Next slide, please. This is just some images of mills that we've got. We've got a disc mill, it's again sort of the kilogram scale, a beater mill, and a attrition mill, hammer mills, knife mills. Uh, we've got energy consumption that can be gained or pulled off of both our kilogram scale and our ton scale milling systems to help inform techno-economic analyses, you know, as well as analysis of the separation that you're getting out of each of these pieces of equipment. We've got sieves for both wet and dry materials. So we have just a wide range of size reduction and fractionation tools. Next slide, please. So, and as mentioned, we collect power data. Uh, we also look at ways to incorporate the data output for these things into machine learning models. I don't do that particular research myself, so I can't speak to it in depth. But as we work with various companies, we'll have maybe their original data sets with an RGB, you know, sort of visual camera. We're adding tools like in your IR, mid IR, XRF to try and probe deeper into some of these materials that are coming across these sorting systems and actually just improve overall separations as well as inputting the data on process throughputs, energy consumptions, and quality from these spectroscopic tools into your know, sort of machine learning industry of the future models, as well as our TEA and LCA analyses. Next slide. So this is just another visualization of the um, different types of spectroscopic tools that we would incorporate in one of these sort of separation systems. Next slide. And as we pull these things apart, we characterize it quite well. We've got a lot of physically validated models for pre-processing and materials handling. So using different um, what is it? Definite, I can't remember the types of modeling. Um, so we will characterize particle sizes and shapes, compressibilities, yield strengths, all that stuff. And they will put it into, the modeling team will put it into physically realistic models, but also combined with our throughput data and other measured parameters such that we can develop models that help inform how your hoppers or mills or plug screw feeders are going to feed. Next slide, please. And so the combined with the detailed mechanical testing, also working with partners like the National Renewable Energy Lab, um, we have helped develop models that can say, hey, if you feed your mill at this rate, you will plug it. Or, you know, if it has this kind of incoming particle size and a desired final particle size, you know, that lowers your throughput. And, you know, again, we're able to take these large, large bits of processing data and combine them into useful, physically realistic models. Next slide, please. And so we've got these throughput models. As mentioned earlier, we also work on the harvest and collection side. So we put this all together for supply chain mapping. Where are your wastes? 
what quality are they, what tools might you need to convert them into a uh, well-specified feedstock for your desired conversion process, what do the economics and life cycle assessments of this all look like. You know, these are the, we've got a pretty strong, very strong modeling team here associated with that aspect of it as well. Uh, next slide. And we take a lot of this data, at least anything that is they've asked to make publicly available, and we put it, much of it at least, into our biomass feedstock library. So that is where you can look at different quality assessments of corn stover, composition, ash, ash speciation, those types of things, and sort of understand how variability might impact your process from a big, from a big picture. Or if you are a university who's just looking for a well-characterized material that has been benchmarked in a bunch of different conversion systems kind of all throughout this bioenergy ecosystem, you can request samples from us and we're more than happy to send out samples from our library, yeah, generally on the scale of grams to kilograms. If you're asking for tons, yeah, that's something we'll have to find a project, put a project together for to do. Next slide. Yeah, so the takeaway message is really that we focus a lot on taking wastes and pre-processing them in a way that they, you have a very reliable, high quality feedstock coming out the other end so that you meet your conversion yields, you meet your you know, operational reliability and like throughput yields. Um, and really without focusing on making high quality feedstocks, it will be impossible to solve problems with flowability and handling fractionation for you know, general feedstock stability. So we're here to work with people to help manage that. Next slide. And yeah, there's my contact information. Thank you so much. Questions. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation. Um, I do have one question, and yes, uh, audience or uh, attendees, if you have any questions, please uh, put them in the Q&A box. Uh, so we've heard a little bit, or we, there were some attendees earlier in the day who asked a few questions about solid state fermentation. I know that you all at Buffnup have uh, studied solid state fermentation, but for pre-processing purposes, I believe you've even looked at off-gas analysis, correct me if I'm wrong. Can you comment a little bit about that? and? Kind of maybe uh, if you if there are um, collaborations you already have in the space or you see potential opportunities, and how would you see it go, fitting into a food industry in the future or vice versa? What did you learn from the food industry that's helping you right now understand the biomass problem? Multi-part question. Sorry. Yeah, and I'm going to have to refer the first part of that question, the solid state fermentation, to Lynn. <laughs> or you know, I, if you have. Yeah, I can have her talk with you about that because I'm afraid I, I work more on the thermochem side of the house, so I am not aware of everything we've done on the biochem side. Given that, you know, we've got a team of mm, call it 30 some odd people. Yeah, there's more than I can know for certain. Um, and then as far as the food industry um, question, a lot of it is really just a, a mental model, if you will, on how this type of fractionation can be valuable. Uh, principally, we have found that uh, at least the first iteration of the bioenergy industry was very much into just get a hammer mill, dense, pelletize it, and we're going to work with it from there. So selling this idea of fractionation creating value has just been something that we've been working at for the last few years. And as experiments have gone on, it's really started to prove its worth. So um, the the model what you are showing finite element analysis based work is that right yeah and I think discrete element analysis discrete. there was a DEM but I couldn't remember what the the D was for yeah so again I see like parallels to let's say a pharma industry or the novel uh, food industry uh, do you do you have any collaborations or do you anticipate any of these this modeling efforts kind of spilling over to other areas. We hope so. <laughs> so we, we've started to develop it more for um, like 
high solid slurry processing it might matter more for the food industry but those are models are still in their infancy i believe they were some smooth particle hydrodynamics based um, and so you can kind of incorporate the multiple phases and the elasticity of the particles i'm not a modeler i just try and supply them with data but yeah that's an area where we could probably collaborate with and learn from anybody in the food processing industry. It's a noble cause, supplying modelers with data. So, <laughs> <laughs> it um, is. sometimes they do amazing amounts with very little data, and then sometimes I'm like, I cannot collect all the data you need. <laughs> sure. Uh, any other questions for Luke? Not we can uh, stay on this contact slide for about a minute before we move to the next presenter. Thanks, Luke. All right. Well, Actually, thank you yeah. for the opportunity, Deepti. Okay, our next speaker will be Matt Gardner at BioP2P. Okay. Well, thank you to the ABPDU team, Leah and Deepti and the whole crew for getting all of us together. Great to see so many familiar faces here and. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation. Uh, let's see. Can I do my advancing? Let's see. I think I can. Okay. Thanks very much. So we're really excited to uh, debut something new. We uh, have just published the Bioprocess to Product Network, which is a an online repository of information that uh, serves primarily the the part of the industry is still going through scale up. And so uh, we basically uh, were having a conversation uh, that for us was rooted in California, but ended up taking us all over the country with a, a group of uh, co-founders, including our, our colleague, Jim DeClo, who's here and others, and found the same issues everywhere, obviously, as you all know, uh, but have had this conversation repeat itself in, uh, in Iowa with colleagues at Iowa State and the state government, and again in North Carolina with North Carolina State and the North Carolina Biotech Center and, and others, and kept finding that as we uh, continued to uh, to go through these sort of travels and uh, came back together and and thought this is uniform enough, the, the nature of these challenges that uh, people must be reinventing wheels. And so uh, we found that uh, so many entrepreneurs are having to uh, go through that reinvention process that something simpler uh, could be created in, a, in an online resource. So uh, we established something called the Bioprocess to Product Network, which is uh, now live at the address that you see on the bottom of each of these pages, which is a free nonprofit uh, directory of open pilot facilities available to support industry. Now, we're a nonprofit. We're committed to keeping this resource uh, free and open, uh, and uh, and and really just exist to support uh, the bioeconomy and and entrepreneurs coming through uh, their own growth curve. We found a number of issues in common in every one of those conversations. In fact, a uh, one hundred percent of the companies and and users that we spoke to as we uh, went around these travels and and to uh, you know conferences and so forth had issues with identifying uh, the ideal workforce in the communities that they're operating in and had trouble hiring to open positions that they already had, not prospectively looking ahead, but hiring into positions they currently had. Uh, so we began to take some of those kind of frequently raised issues and turn them into uh, some priorities for uh, mapping with where uh, those uh, available tolling facilities exist. And we then continue to find that not only were uh, those issues in common, but so were the the challenges with uh, the people and the, you know the, the implementations themselves, and uh, so much of what was happening, obviously over the last three four years with the uh, boom in in biomanufacturing. So we turned it actually into a map, and so the the resource itself is designed to create that sort of overlapping picture of. Uh, facilities available for hire, uh, nearby training programs, feedstocks, and we'll continue to add features as we go. Uh, this uh, version, as you can see, shows you where training programs are established near uh, the facilities that we've uh, identified 
uh, and uh, have taken through a little bit of a, an internal process. And then, of course, thanks to our partners at NREL, we've got uh, lots of great biomass feedstock information uh, uploaded into the interface uh, as well. Uh, there's a, uh, as I mentioned, there's a, a significant uh, response rate that we got that was pretty doggone close to 100% where uh, workforce and hiring was a top challenge experienced by all. And so we ended up uh, in the course of uh, developing the directory, not only working on where those training programs exist uh, from coast to coast, but then also uh, seeing how we could support industry in uh, its own hiring needs. And so the, the Career Center is something that we added in uh, the course of that build out and uh, identified that um, this is such an acute need for industry that uh, you know we've we, we could continue building new partnerships with training programs and not come close to satiating the the demand as we look ahead. So uh, some of the great things about features like this are you know if you're an employer uh, building a profile in the career center is free, so you can just begin even the basic stuff by um, just getting on and uh, the signing up uh, process, the registration process is free. Uh, company profiles free, things like that. So lots of free resources here. Uh, we're excited about all of the above. There are some uh, additional services that come with that and, and how we'll uh, link uh, our uh, uh, ongoing conversation uh, with you or, or part of this as well. So in addition to the, obviously the, the ability to find your next uh, new team member, uh, we've also uh, begun to develop uh, a careers conversation with people who've uh, come into bioprocess careers, maybe with um, indirect uh, career pathways and, and helping tell their stories about how they got to where they are. Um, there's There'll be more of this to come, uh, but that's all part of, for us, a series that we've uh, so far launched as the Spotlight Series with some rotating conversations. Just launched um, last month with Mark Warner just talking about how Liberation Labs decided on Indiana uh, for their first facility and what they're planning to build there uh, in uh, in their first uh, new facility. We have a, our next spotlight is a, uh, a webinar on the 15th of August and it's uh, available for registration uh, for a, a little bit of a closer look at the all the tools available through the site. Uh, so you can sign up on LinkedIn for that. Our team is... Um, uh, hard at work on the directory and continuing to add features. And so we have a few more things to launch before the end of this year. I would just say too that, um, I'll, I'll try and go back just to highlight this very quickly. Uh, we found when we were going through all the resources we could clearly identify uh, in pilot facilities uh, in the US with um, uh, capacity for taking on additional work, that we had lots of outdated information. And so you'll find about half of the uh, sites listed on the directory today are, um, are have been audited. And so we've that process is ongoing. We found that to be more intensive than we expected. And so we do go through a process to make sure that we've clearly identified not only what capacity any given site may have, but also what um, you know, custom and tailored DSPs they uh, each site might be capable of or uh, what uh, else you might find in their network uh, available for hire. So uh, this is, I would say, an, an iterative process for us. We would uh, love to hear from you and, of course, welcome your participation in it. Uh, everything that you can explore on the site is uh, is free, with the lone exception, I think, of, of placing job ads specifically. If you do go into the Career Center, you'll find that um, the Career Center is a, a partnered tool and uh, individual job listings are, are, uh, are per, per listing uh, cost. So everything else freely available, uh, welcome to explore. And um, we're really excited about having the Bioprocess to Products Network up and available for your perusal. And so I can stop there. And thanks again to the ABPDU team. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, please uh, put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, so Matt, I, I was thinking about this a little bit uh, after we announced this event, that what we have now, what we're doing today is kind of webinar version of what you're doing on a website. And you also are start, have your own webinar now. But it still seems like there is a lack of 
information exchange. What are we missing here? So if you had unlimited funding, would you yeah. do more of what you're doing now? Or is there a whole new thing that you would add? If I had unlimited funding? Well, I think the first part of the answer is, unfortunately, the need doesn't go away. And what, you know, I think if you've been in biotech for two or three of these cycles, I think what we tend to find is you may spend two, three years intensively educating uh, or aiding entrepreneurs and word of mouth, of course, spreads like wildfire in that community. And that helps a lot, but it never stops. And so we've tended to find that even when you think you've reached a sort of level of depth of awareness and understanding the industry that a resource is available like ABPDU, that the next cohort may come along and you've got to sort of start again with uh, entrepreneur outreach and uh, information. So I think the first thing is we've found that people still continue to reinvent wheels, which is why you still have sort of the basic need to educate about business plan writing, right? So the, some of those things still are true, even when you believe you've sort of reached common knowledge. And so I think that's an ongoing challenge. If I had unlimited resources, what else would I do? I think, um, you know, every every process is somewhat unique. I think there's a really interesting conversation in uh, a whole group of these um, of these earlier stage companies that are arriving at product. Now, obviously, there's an enormous um, uh, cohort of of companies funded the last five seven years during that great bull run that we've just come through. Uh, which are arriving uh, in the scene. We're going to hear from one in a minute uh, as well. Uh, I guess I would um, work on some of the issues that they've found they have in common with one another. So I know that Lawrence Berkeley does this very well. If there were pre-competitive research uh, consortia that would be possible to tackle some of the challenges the industry has in common, uh, with yield and rate and and you know I know some of the things that Pow is working on as well with continuous and I think some of those common challenges uh, would help and and advance the entire industry. Um, so I think you know Deep D, you've sat in those rooms for years like I have and listened to what some of those issues are and uh, the cycle time doesn't get easier the 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 sunk cost in capex doesn't get easier. So I think some of those things are probably just the cost of doing business for this industry. But uh, if I if I win the lottery tomorrow, am I going to build a great big tank farm? I don't know. I don't know. I think maybe 10 small ones. Thank you, Matt. That was a great answer. Anything else that uh, we sh I should be asking you? Um, anything else you want to share here? I do well, really think BioP 2 p is a great resource for entrepreneurs, um, many of them who work with ABPD at this time. So anything we should be looking at that our entrepreneurs should be looking at. Uh, yeah, thank you website. for the question too. I think uh, we do have a few more tricks up our sleeve for uh, before the end of this year with a few additional launches of features and um, I'll say resources. So whether you are a product company or a process innovator, we're interested in exploring things with you. And I don't want to get ahead of myself too much, but we have more in store as well. Looking forward to all of that, Matt. Thank you very much.